Before I get into what I want to cover in the, in, in the, the talk tonight, uh, I suppose a, a few preliminary remarks. Um, when the, the drama unfolded in inner city Johannesburg a couple of weeks ago, I thought, shit, how can this happen now, three weeks before my talk, my talk that I've just agreed on the title at UJ, uh, because I can't possibly uh, be, be speaking about urban regeneration and its salvation capabilities in the context of such a dramatic set of events. Um, but as with many other things, uh, life and everything else moves at an incredible pace in Johannesburg. And uh, uncharacteristic to people from Cape Town, you seem to have, as a city, managed to kind of slug it out in the course of two weeks and come to some kind of negotiation and some kind of compromise, uh, if social media is to be believed. And um, yeah, so fortunately, uh, I feel a little bit less guilty that I'm not going to say anything about that. So that was just my proviso that I'm not speaking about that. But of course, in question and answer time, I'm very happy to enter the fray and, and give my five cents worth. Instead, what I want to do uh, this evening is really reflect a little bit on, I suppose, as a bunch of South Africans, where are we at on this question 20 years hence? And as I will demonstrate, uh, the track record um, is not that great. And it is an opportune time to take stock and try and understand why is that the case? And what's the possibility for fundamentally rethinking or reimagining the agenda uh, of urban regeneration? And I suppose in broad terms, uh, the question of city making uh, in the South African context. So the bulk of my remarks this evening will really be to try and paint a picture of a set of conceptual moves, a set of conceptual frameworks that suggest that it is really important to connect the big macro questions, the, the large scale transitions in the city, and the micro transformations that has to happen at the intimate scales of the city where people live, where people experience the brutality of a dysfunctional urbanism, and where people try and keep life and limb and dreams together. In the final instance, my argument will suggest that all of this demands of us to return to the question of urban politics, to return to the imaginary of the political and what the political and citizenship may mean in the contemporary context. So by definition, it will be broad brush I will draw on just one international example and uh, on that note which is Medellin in Colombia and uh, colleagues of mine, uh, in fact Alejandro Echeverri from Medellin has just arrived and other colleagues from uh, India and the Netherlands and so on is all part of a two-day conference the next, uh, the next two days in, in Ekuruleni in Germiston. Um, so I'm, you know, I felt it was safer to, uh, to try my luck with one Colombian in the room as opposed to a room full of Joe Burgers. So, uh, so, but if you want the real story in Colombia, Alejandro will be here for, for the tea break so you can speak to him. So let's get a couple of definitions out of the way. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it, it's just not the most interesting part. So we sort of know from the literature that the idea that, that regeneration denotes an attempt to try and reverse a set of processes and dynamics and conditions that has generated a negative spiral. So it is a targeted intervention to try and understand what those drivers may be and to begin to re systematically reverse them and ideally in, in a holistic way. So according to some scholars, urban regeneration is driven by governments typically as a special effort in underperforming places to stimulate transformation in local conditions. Typically, initiative seeks to realize the potential of places by developing local assets, keyword, and opportunities with a view of achieving self-sustaining dynamics of community development or community empowerment, whatever the work might be. So, of course, walking into the post-apartheid era, there was a lot of urban regeneration that was called for. There was lots that required attention, and in some ways, because of the peculiar history of black dispossession and exclusion in the, in the urban realm, almost all of the areas where black people were aggregated qualified, in a way, for a form of urban regeneration or renewal, 
or urban development, as the case might be. However, the problem is, both internationally and, as I will demonstrate in, in the case of South Africa over the last period, because it tries to be holistic and it tries to deal with the multidimensional facets of, um, of negative dynamics or negative spirals, interventions very, very quickly become muddled. People can't quite tell what should precede what, what's the relative weight of importance to be ascribed to the social versus the economic or the ecological. Renewal quickly becomes instrumentalized because it represents a pot of resources that can be deployed for political purposes, of course. And often then, what is, con what is meant to be highly targeted strategic interventions becomes very quickly dissipated. Now, as I will tr try and very briefly show, if you look back to 1994, we've had three generations of urban renewal in South Africa. The first generation, which was called the Mandela Presidential Integration Projects, um, and there were 13 of those, um, we, it was sort of an attempt in the early days to demonstrate that there was an agenda for what to do with the legacy of the apartheid city, but also marshal in a really rapid form a whole number of pots of investment and resources to begin to demonstrate that it was possible in a relatively short period of time to turn around the fortunes of excluded townships and to some extent the informal dimensions of that. So what we see at the time, similar to the current discourse, infrastructure-driven renewal was very much the, the tenor of the moment. And there was an acknowledgement that re re regularization of informal settlement was an important policy goal. Um, and, and that, of course, then dissipated and made a return only in the last few years. This program was overtaken then in 1999 by a State of the Nation address by President Mbeki. We announced a whole series of rural and <coughs> urban uh, um, um, renewal nodes in South Africa. And there's a whole bunch of really interesting anecdotal uh, urban legends to be told about this, amongst them the fact that somebody in the presidency threw a dart at a map of South Africa and kind of drew circles around it, and that's how these nodes came to be. Uh, but that is more reflection, that, that particular urban myth, uh, a reflection of the frustration at the inarticulacy from a policy design point of view of that particular program. So, for example, as you all know, Alexandra Renewal Program was the case in Johannesburg. In Cape Town, we decided we'll just take half of the city, Kylie Chen, which will explain, draw a circle around it, and there you go. It's an urban renewal node. And so that particular pro program suffered from a, a serious, um, uh, 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 from a serious case of, of a lack of focus, a lack of strategic, geographic, spatial uh, precision. What it did try and do, though, was to facilitate mechanisms, extraordinary mechanisms, to overcome the silo-based nature of the state and to facilitate joint-up government and, most importantly, not offer new money, but force government departments and different levels of government to reprioritize existing budgets. So it was sort of institutionally an interesting experiment. Um, some of the investments that went into Alex made interesting impacts. Speaking recently to Julian Baskin, who was the renewal uh, uh, sort of chief operating officer, I suppose, uh, it was an interesting tale of, I suppose, missed opportunities uh, with the benefit of hindsight. What is interesting is that this program has never been discontinued. So as far as I know, and as far as I can tell, it still exists officially within government programs. There are still people within local government and provincial government responsible for these things. but. In some ways, it has been overtaken since 2006 with the emergence of the National Development Project, the program in National Treasury. And this is a completely different animal. It's a different beast. And very, very interesting because instead of taking the, if you will, scattergun approach of the second generation of urban renewal in South Africa, a, a try to learn lessons from the, interestingly enough, for the architects in the room, from uh, the new urbanism movement in the US. And I tried to suggest that it was much more important to take a fine grain approach to look at the specificity within the urban fabric and understand where the acupuncture points are, that through strategic articulation of design-driven interventions, you could begin to unlock certain energies within townships and, and other um, devalued areas. 
Again, different to the previous generations, it's what one could call design savvy. It offered a new, fresh pot of money to municipalities, and it argued to them that if you can solicit interesting design proposals about how we can change the logics and the dynamics and the energies within township through these, if you will, strategic interventions, you could then attract these resources to do detailed design, and then you could begin to intervene in the urban fabric to effect the desired turnaround or to effect the desired multiplier dynamic that desired-led precinct-based urban interventions could, could, could achieve. This program is arguably, and certainly compared to the first two generations, doing really well. And just as a sidebar, um, that department has to be congratulated. Every bit of knowledge, every bit of thinking that has gone into that program is available on their site. I was amazed at a workshop that they co-convened three weeks ago. All of the presentations, the minutes of that workshop on spatial targeting is already up and available on the site. So for scholars and students interested in this field, there's a fantastic treasure trove there waiting to be dissected and waiting to be critiqued, analyzed, expanded, and stretched. And hopefully, some of the provocations that I will offer tonight will, will assist in, in that particular undertaking. Now, what's the track record of all of this effort? And of course, this is an incredibly potted history. Uh, I'm being very superficial, and, and, and it's, it's by definition stylized. But I think we can draw a couple of conclusions about the track record of, of, this, uh, of these different generations of renewal. Um, you've all, of course, seen this trashy uh, Hollywood rom-com failure to launch, right? So uh, it kind of it comes to mind when you think of a lot of these in initiatives. Lots of money, lots of people, lots of effort thrown at particular programs, and you just can't quite get lift off. Or in the case of this particular Hollywood drama, uh, you can't get um, the, the, uh, the sloppy adult to, uh, to leave the house. It can't go independent. Many of it has had very limited economic impact, and by extension, limited impact on structural unemployment. And as a result, it didn't do anything to shift what one would call, what I would define as the fundamental challenge, which is economic disconnect. As a consequence, and related to this, and not unsurprising, of course, is we've also seen very limited private leverage. So some people would point to Soweto and say, well, that's maybe a different story. Isn't that the case? Uh, there's people in the room who know Soweto much better than I am, and they can certainly, in discussion time, comment on that. I would be surprised, though, if one could argue that the turnaround of Soweto is as a result of any of these generational programs. It's a, it's a set of interventions at a different order of, of magnitude and a pulling together of investments and sequencing them that I think um, doesn't quite fall within the realm of any of the three generations of urban renewal we've spoken about. What we've also seen, I think, are a number of inappropriate investments, leaving some white elephants and maybe a few gray ones in their midst. And with a gray elephant, I suppose I'm trying to suggest that it, I think it is inaccurate and wrong to think of all of the public infrastructure institutions that these programs generate, that they are all necessarily white elephants or inappropriate. Some of them get reappropriated, some of them begin to generate a different set of unanticipated logics and dynamics, which I think is important to understand. And certainly, we don't have enough research to make a call uh, one way or the other. But it would be fair to say, if I certainly look at the case of Kyle Litcher and Mitchell Splay, that there are certainly a number of, large, of, of rather large and imposing white elephants that roam the Cape Flats. Now, what are the underlying issues? Uh, that, that track record is, in a way, quite a superficial reading. I think that one of the issues we struggle with in South Africa and across all levels of government, and, and to some extent, and I'll, I'll sort of put my foot in it and suggest even within the academy, that there are very few people who are able to read and understand economic drivers. And yeah, I'm not talking just about formal economic activity, formal inward investment. But I'm talking about that whole spectrum of formal, informal, social, and solidarity economies. All of these um, respond to and drive on different sets of logics and drivers and dynamics. And when you review or look at the various programs and initiatives of different local authorities, there's very little evidence that there's an engagement with, with those logics and an understanding of them. I think that we also have 
uh, in a, in a, again, as, as a generalization, an inability to really grapple with and confront and mold what one could call spatial dynamics of places. Uh, and this, again, I think is connected with a misreading of scale in terms of placemaking. And here what I have in mind is really the gross error that was committed to suggest that you can simply identify an entire township or an entire enclave of, 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 of disinvestment, such as Mitchell's Plan and Kailich in the case of Cape Town, as a relevant scale within which to think about urban regeneration or renewal. It simply makes no sense from a perspective of placemaking. There's also been, and this presumably is very relevant for, for a lot of the colleagues in the faculty here, almost no appreciation or understanding or recognition of the importance of design. This, of course, is being corrected at the moment through the design criteria or the terms of uh, the, the, the transport-oriented development standard that has been produced by the NDP in, in National Treasury, but it's early days. And certainly, the people who are meant to drive these initiatives within local authorities and the civil groups that are meant to hold them accountable, I would argue, suffer from a very, very low level of design and spatial literacy. And, and this is something that I'll return to a little bit later on. And there's certainly been minimal investment or appreciation of the importance of optimizing what one could call latent social relations and assets. So here again, and the Latin American case is very interesting, when you look at the successful experiments in Brazil or in Colombia or in Chile and Argentina, in almost all of their big systematic programmatic interventions, up to 20, 25% of total uh, um, project cost is devoted to the social aspect, to participation, to social enrollment, to building skill sets to ensure that there's the capability for community ownership and management, maintenance and repair of whatever investments are made. And this for me really goes to the heart of the connection between building citizenship that is connected to place building and the importance of, if you will, shifting the control and the direction of the resources that goes into these processes to the project of, of, an, of, a, of a larger uh, democratic urban politics. And again, it's a theme that I'll return to in conclusion. And then something that, that is maybe less specific and less tangible, but I really think is at the core of a much larger problematic, is that our public officials hate the city. Our politicians hate urbanism. They hate cityness. There's no innate sense of appreciation of the poetic beauty and the poetic, if you will, um, um, essence that is associated with the complexity that the contradictions and conflict and drama of cities represent. And because we don't have a discourse of cityness and because we don't have, if you will, a set of repertoires that can both recognize and appreciate and articulate um, the phenomenological essence of, of, of what makes cities such incredible uh, uh, constructions, it is very hard for politicians and policy managers, if you will, to encounter the complexity and the contradictions of urban regeneration or renewal and not, in a sense, feel overwhelmed or feel a sense of defeat that change is so difficult. Right? And so there's something about the aggregate disposition with regard to uh, cities and our relationship with cities in South Africa, which I think in a way requires much greater problematization and in a way uh, um, a building connects with the humanities and with literature and with art and so on, I think has an important role to play to begin to shift that. And then a couple of very specific things, which is just, you know, since I have a platform, I might as well put all my bugbears out there uh, for debate. Again, having worked at all levels of government and continuing to move between the academy and, and public policy and, and civil organizations, the one thing that strikes me, and especially when I'm able to, if you will, step back and think of our context and dynamics uh, from a comparative perspective, is our absolute obsession with being comprehensive. We want everything to be integrated all of the time, everybody included, and as a result, we think that we're not allowed to move unless we can tick all of the boxes. And this has generated over multiple generations of public policy making a paralysis. 
an inability to give leadership and an inability to specify and rationalize and justify choices. And because we're not able to debate and contest choices, we struggle to actually often do anything. And, and I think a lot of why we have so many rollovers and so on and so on. And maybe more controversially for a lot of uh, activists in the room, is I would argue is a lack of know-how and confidence to play market forces. You don't build cities in late modernity in the context of the, 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 the unique post-colonial reality we confront. And you can somehow keep yourself immune from market forces. That's a fundamental error. And I can say more about that in question time. Linked to that particular point is that, again, you see across many municipalities, the drivers of these initiatives, the inability to assemble deals. If you're going to intervene, if you're going to marshal resources, build the coalitions and networks, you've got to strike deals. There is no way around deal making. But again, if you go back to and dissect some of the, the many failed projects that we have, I would argue that this is a fairly central phenomenon that we see across some of our problems. And then finally, and most importantly, limited capacity, and I've, I've, I've made this point in a slightly different way before, to create and empower what I would call appropriate delivery institutions that can make the catalytic interventions work. Um, and of course, we have some exceptions across the landscape, but as yet, I think we are a long way off from both the theorization of institutional uh, dynamics of urban regeneration and also tangible examples of what could make these things think. So this is sort of my stylized history of where we've come from, what, we, what the legacies we're confronting. And then the next, um, in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, I want to beg your indulgence. I want to sort of take you on a, on a, on a journey and, and kind of try and, and, and build a set of frameworks for trying to think about what I would call the, the sort of regional macro dimensions of the transformation agenda, because urban regeneration in the narrow sense have got to be bolted onto a larger conception of how we transform our cities. And not just at the regional level, but then also at the micro level. And at the heart of this is the idea that we have a much better understanding today of what it will take, in policy terms, if you will, to transform our urban systems, and within that, build a unique place-based, culturally specific uh, um, articulation of urban democracy. So the, the sort of first macro statement in this regard is really to suggest that there are four fundamental transitions that's required if you want to foster and build uh, a long-term structural transformation. And this is in the domain of sustainable urban infrastructure, which has got a dimension that I call social infrastructure, which is related to placemaking, specific localities, neighborhoods, and a dimension that's about the citywide region, which is the network infrastructures that, if you will, conduct the flows and the resources and the energies that enable an urban system to reproduce itself. These operate at different scales, but they are connected through very particular articulations within the urban system. Of course, both of those are inherently spatial. They articulate themselves in relation to land markets. And land markets, we know, are fundamental to the structure of opportunity within the city and are connected to the nature of economies. And in the, in, with regard to the economic operating system of cities, there's a whole series of questions about how do we simultaneously deal with greater productivity competitiveness, but also in a much more holistic way, so that we can see the connects between the informal, live viewed practices, social economies, imperatives for the green economy, and understand the spatial dimensions of that. And of course, at the heart of this is democratic and participatory governance. Now, an important part of the story is an imaginary about the economy, because unless we are able to fundamentally shift our understanding of what economies are about, what the drivers are, it is not possible to make the connect to structural unemployment. And structural unemployment, I am positing today, is the most important criteria for whether we can achieve successful urban regeneration or not. If our urban interventions is not able to deal with the question of joblessness and everything that's associated to that, we will continue to see failure. So thinking about the economy in more holistic terms is really important. And this particular body of work from John Clark, I find really helpful 
What it tries to do, and it's a different way, uh, John Friedman in, in 1993 has also built uh, what he calls the whole economy model, which one could also invoke, but this is maybe more relevant for the argument about the relationship between the social economy and urban gener gener regeneration that I want to make tonight. So what this diagram tries to reflect is that most economies, if you look at them holistically, operate at different scales. There is what you can call, if you will, the formal for-profit, private-oriented economy. There's the public sector-driven economy. And then there's that whole realm of the third economy, where families operate, where we have the non-renumerated work of often women that are the underbedding of the, the under, under uh, um, uh, um, toe of, of what happens within society and economies. And then a whole series of voluntary activities, including worker cooperatives. And it's much more useful to think of economy, economic institutions across the spectrum. And really to begin to try and understand how can we think of places in relation to this third economy, in relation to building the social economy as a key foundational stone for activating and optimizing the productivity and competitiveness of both informal economic activity and of course the formal economy and access to that formal economy. Now, of course, this is, not, this is a descriptive frame, right? It includes the black economy, which is very significant, as we all know. It includes the gray economy, which is a critical part of the livelihood practices of most urban dwellers, especially uh, uh, the excluded. So keep that in mind. So if we then think of, if you will, this holistic framework, and we think of what are the key strategic elements to connect, it helps us to begin to understand what are some of the macro entry points in terms of the envelope of urban investments that we've got to repurpose to begin to have a dynamic effect in the way that local economies operate? So I want in the next few slides just to unpack a little bit these three elements, transport, human settlements, and public infrastructure. And the reason I want to go through this is because we spend at the moment something between 30 and 32 billion rand per annum on our housing program. And we all know the disaster that that's produced. And I'll say a little bit more about transport as well. So again, remaining at the macro framework level, it is very important to understand the connects between this and that the key tissue that binds this is, of course, the commons. And the commons and reclaiming the commons is a fundamental <coughs> political principle in beginning to rethink, our, to begin to populate our imaginary about what urban regeneration should be delivering. And at the heart of this is this idea of placemaking, right? So let's quickly go through these different aspects of transport, uh, housing, and placemaking. So very quickly on transport. We kind of all know the gospel. You need your transport to be integrated. You need one ticket to allow you to move intermodally. And we need to get people out of the cars, onto the IRTs and how trains and so forth and so forth. And I won't go into all of the public debates on that in Gauteng in particular. Um, the point is kind of we all know the gospel, right? The problem is that, of course, at the moment, Gauteng has just released its 25-year, 20 or 30 or 50-year integrated transport plan. And we now hear that Gauteng is going to be extended by another 170 kilometers or something like that. Of course, nobody then tells us uh, whether Bombella is going to get another guaranteed profit um, uh, taking on the extension of it over the next 30 years, but that's another story. The point about all of this is that we continue to dream this fantasy, but we are unable and unwilling to challenge and confront the fact that institutionally, because we've fragmented the fiscal system, rail subsidies are kept by a parastatal nationally, bus subsidies are run by somebody else, taxis are operated by provinces, and metros are left with integrated transport planning, right? So somehow they're gonna wave their magic wand and all of these other role players are gonna come to the party and we're gonna get this ideal. Now why it's important uh, that I kind of need to overstate this is because getting the integrated transport system right is the absolutely non-negotiable starting point for rebuilding the commons and rethinking our challenges with regard to housing. So if you take the typology that uh, Knowledge Factory and CSIR works with in terms of the range of settlements in South Africa, don't worry about the detail of that. 
They've kind of built their own typology that ranges from extreme peripheral, marginal, informal, through to township, old township, inner city, um, middle class suburbia, and, and elites. Right, so if we think of that as precarious uh, through to, to mobile as a kind of spectrum, right, across that. Now, in each of these conditions, you would need a very different conception of what the intervention point should be. And within each of those, again, transport plays a critical role, right? But here, for example, in city upgrading, of course, has got to be the big story. So you cannot continue to build the kind of freestanding public housing that we know in that case. If you're looking at inner cities or you look at consolidated township, you're talking about a different package, a different suite of interventions that needs to be calibrated. And if you talk about the wealthy areas, of course, the key challenge for us, especially in Johannesburg and Gauteng, as it continues to absorb uh, the migratory flows of the country, is to make sure that all future private developments, elite developments where all of us live, has a minimum component of inclusionary housing, for example, right? We've been talking about this for five, six, seven years. We just can't get the legislation passed. And I'm not going to venture as to why that's the case. But it's important to understand that unless this kind of fine-grained, spectrum-oriented conception of the suite of interventions required for different categories of settlement is threaded together by transport, public infrastructure, and the absolute imperative of building very rapidly a large stock of low-cost rental opportunities for the majority of the working class in our cities because that's what they need and that's what will make the difference uh, uh, in, as well, in, in terms of their livelihood prospects. Now, of course, the question then that arises from this particular re-problematization of the human settlements challenge is what social infrastructure can drive and sustain these investments? And I want to come back to that point about, if you will, the social, social architecture that will make all of this possible. But at this point, I want to take you somewhere else. By, I want to kind of use the images of Medellin and what Alejandro and his colleagues have been able to achieve in a very, very short period of time in Medellin, Colombia, as a way of reflecting on and animating the discussion of what I mean by public infrastructure. And public infrastructure, of course, is critical to establishing the possibility of a commons within our cities. So this is the city. Um, so it's, it's a little bit bleeded out, uh, the, the resolution. Um, uh, and again, Alejandro, my apologies. <laughs> this feels very weird to this. He's kind of, you know, the walking embodiment of all of this. Um, he managed all of these projects uh, in the first phase. The city is, in a, is a creek, basically, a massive valley. Uh, these are very steep mountains. The elites live on this side, the poor live on the top. So the higher you are on the slopes in the barrios, the poorer you are. And so what this plan basically does is it takes a holistic view of the city as a whole, tries to understand the connectivity between where wealth sits in the city. And these lines are cable cars that then connect that. And down in the middle runs a metro system. And the interventions then are strategically inserted into the core of the poorest parts of the city. Um, these are the, the five neighborhoods that were targeted. And, and I'm literally just showing you, I'm like flipping a photo album, right, very quickly. I'm not going into detail on this because um, it is just to, to, to kind of sort of illustrate a point. What I really appreciate about this, and this is the central valley, and this is the sort of consolidated formal city and the wealthier parts over there, and right in the middle is a botanical garden, which is free, the access. This is a science museum for children and youth. Access is free. And on another day, I will wax lyrical about this particular architectural gem, but that's another story. And the point of this is that this is where the different cities connect. And at that knuckle, they've built a whole series of public, very high quality infrastructures that facilitate placemaking and publicness in the commons. This is a close up image of that particular uh, educational and science library, which I said is free. And Alejandro, you designed this, right? You were the architect on this, yes. Um, and this thing is an example of one of the poorest areas right up the north of the mountain, which shows aspects of a multiplicity of interventions focused on the public realm that then gets introduced. So this is the cable car system. 
um, which is not an option for the gold mine dumps, by the way. Um, so don't be tempted. Um, these are very steep gradients. And this is a public library that runs uh, for, for, for 14 hours a day and is free. This is a close-up on the inside of the library and, uh, and just a sense of the spectacular nature of the architecture. Then the domains below these cable car systems then are then reclaimed from the cars to create generous pavements with infrastructure for informal trading and of course for children to play and so forth and so forth. And very importantly, the transport connections always end up in and resolve itself in a combination of a school, a series of small business uh, enterprises that gets incubated around the space, and then a network within the barrios that connects the school to various cultural spaces and cultural activities. This is another example of some of uh, these public infrastructures that get inserted into these communities. And you can see the relationship between the soccer pitch, the library, the cable car system. And then very typically, very strong emphasis on, if you will, modest interventions that has dramatic catalytic effect in that it facilitates connectivity across creeks, but not just creeks, also cultural divides and uh, social divides because different gangs previously in the heyday of violence and the drug gang-related cultures in Medellin would, would, would sort of rule the roost in both sides of these. But very importantly, always looking at these small insertions to activate life for youth, for children, to make it possible to return play uh, to everyday life and safety and passive surveillance. Again, moving from a station to that library, the public realm gets defined, gets activated, and facilitated always through play parks. Very, very modest interventions. And again, for me, what is most impressive about Medellin is not the excellent architecture and the excellent public architecture that is resolved, but it is the careful attention to programming. And if there's one instructive lesson, I think, from Medellin and generally from the Latin American experience, it is the importance of activating spaces once they are built. Um, so this is an example where popular culture, hip-hop cultures and so on are used, connected to issues of oral histories as a way of animating these places. Of course, there's a lot more to be said. I'm painting a particularly rosy picture. You can get the, 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 the less glossy version from Alejandro. Um, but the point that I want to make about this is that throughout this process and at the heart of it is a spatial imaginary about how does one intervene in existing topographies and work with communities, apply design principles, but then begin to negotiate what can be manifest within a budget envelope and what makes sense in terms of what that community needs. But not abdicating the responsibility of quality design. And I think that there is a tension and a set of issues there that is really important for us to consider. Moving on then, having spoken about this public infrastructure point, I want to then begin to suggest that if we look at the typical conception of how one reverses, if you will, the dynamic of community investment and the empowerment of poor households, the logic is a little bit like this, right? So you hope that you can increase income, the asset base, the skills, the well-being of poor households through investments in the built environment. You hope that the RDP house is going to increase in value. And as that happens, investment confidence grows. This, of course, then triggers a bunch of inward investment in multipliers. New opportunities arise, and so on. And of course, we know that after 3.2 million RDP housing units that have been delivered, this hasn't quite happened. The magic has been missing. And I think, for me, the key lesson about this is that we haven't understood the importance of prioritizing the public realm and public infrastructure as a critical component to activate the investment in households. So we've kind of got it the wrong way around. And in my view, if we can aggregate the resources we have for public housing, for public transport, the various investments in economic infrastructure within townships and so forth, and begin to connect that to a logic and a practice of placemaking that puts community works programs at the center 
and build the capability within communities to draw unemployed youth together in an organized fashion to actively make place by investing in green infrastructure, restoring a sense of nature, a sense of place, a sense of well-being, taking care of all of the protection and maintenance of the range of public facilities we have in every single township and informal settlement across South Africa, really understand the transformative power of the arts and of sport and use cultural services as a legitimate and necessary category of public works. And of course, attend to the enormous amount of our citizens that require home-based care. We can literally amass hundreds of thousands of experiences of work that is not just a mechanism to connect people to the labor market, but it is very importantly a cohort of people that can actively make place. And it returns us to the importance of the investment in people as the drivers of regeneration, as opposed to buildings. Right? And so, without elaborating on this point, I want to suggest that it is very important that we can't anticipate this to happen in the absence of the creation and investment in an institutional frame, a mesh, if you will, that is able to equip people to fulfill this role. So what kind of institutional platform can indeed reproduce this kind of social infrastructure? In some of the work that I've, that I've published over the last few while, I make a case for a set of mechanisms, institutions to be created in communities, which take the form of, if you will, a training program, an academy where people learn how to run their communities. At the heart of that are hard skills to deploy spatial planning literacy connected with an understanding of budgetary processes as a way of wresting control back from the state in determining local priorities. And very importantly, the capacity to run their own communities through systems of community management. The purpose of this would be to allow communities at a much finer grain than the ward. So I'm not talking about ward committees. I'm talking about a much more intimate scale the ability to develop an understanding of where they want to go, what they want to do with their communities, to make the decisions about what should priori be prioritized and what that could possibly leverage, and of course take responsibility for the maintenance and the growing of whatever that suite of community assets may be. And very, very importantly, I believe that this is a far more effective way of facilitating political accountability than necessarily going to a community meeting or sitting in an in Bezo or going to the ward committee, right? I think that this is a practice-based uh, a, a set of processes that allows a level of transparency and access to an understanding of what the state is about that can produce a very, very different kind of citizenship. And of course, at the heart of this is a vision of social innovation. So if we think of it, right, we already enroll hundreds, tens of thousands of people through community policing forums, health committees, community development workers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in a whole range of interfaces with the state. But we don't manage to pull that together and activate or catalyze what one could call social innovation. And this cannot emerge in the absence of a learning space or imparting very precise, very specific organizational skills. And most importantly, I would argue, in, given our um, <coughs> Uh, given our pathologies around wanting to be comprehensive and wanting everything all at once, fostering the capacity for prioritization. And really importantly, being able to then do stuff, to experiment, to implement. And so in this regard, I've been really fascinated by the work of the violence prevention uh, through urban upgrading project in Kailiche and Cape Town. And they've really by default, in a way, stumbled on this methodology over a period of six years. And this is just one illustration of, if you will, the ways in which building an autonomous data set understanding of the dynamics of Kylie Chen, particularly in their case, what drives insecurity and violence, and connecting that with a design sensibility about how does one then repurpose space? How does one make space into something different? How does one then facilitate a suite of public infrastructures that can begin to reclaim the street and the public square for the citizen and for children in particular. 
and they've been able to then generate a series of public infrastructures um, that is able to then provide some kind of definition and articulation within that neighborhood to produce these kinds of nodal points that make a different set of dynamics possible in the community. So to conclude then, and if you can indulge me for another five minutes, uh, if that's okay, Chair. I want to then turn to the question of politics, because this is, you know, uh, maybe some would argue a somewhat utopian vision. But I, I think we have to ask <clears throat> what kind of politics and praxis can create the incentives and milieu for transformative urban regeneration that can span the micro and the macro, the urgency of the short term and thinking about the long range, and individual empowerment and social freedom, right? And I came across a fantastic quote by uh, Teddy Cruz, who works on the, the, the US border, amongst other places, and also uh, recently on Medellin. And Teddy argues, and in a way this sort of brings us back home to uh, the most challenging dimension of our urban context, the informal. The informal is not just an image of precariousness. It is a compendium of practices, a set of functional urban operations that counter and transgress impose political boundaries and hierarchic economic models. The hidden urban operations of the most compelling cases of, of urban, informal urbanization need to be translated into a new political language with particular spatial consequences. This will lead to new interpretations of housing, infrastructure, property, and citizenship, and inspire new modes of intervention in the contemporary city. As far as I'm concerned, this intimates a very different sensibility of the political, a very different conception of what urban politics might mean, and something that is a little bit more culturally savvy. So in my view, I think that our NGOs, our movements, the, the agents of social transformation in our cities are in a way stuck in a set of repertoires that doesn't allow them to work with the dynamism and the emergent condition of the city. And what I'm yearning for, what I'm interested in is whether it's possible to take the imperatives of democratic decision making around the everyday, around the kind of institutions that I'm suggesting we require, but connecting that also with the popular, connecting that with the everyday, with a new notion of coalition politics that doesn't shy away from the popular, but in a way is able to tap the popular to enroll people in an interest, in a genuine interest in wanting to be the fabric of their communities. I've suggested a set of institutions that can facilitate that. But I would contend that until we are able to resolve what kind of political framing, what set of political institutions can facilitate this culturally resonant notion of citywide politics and the possibility of these kinds of campaigns, it will be very, very difficult to create the breeding ground for, for these kinds of institutions to emerge. Now, this isn't just an abstract politics. I do think, then, in, in, to conclude, that it is possible to think very pragmatically about what the city of Joburg is doing today, what the mayor has to worry about, about all of the infrastructure projects, about everything that is in train, but to, if you will, recalibrate that, frame it slightly differently. So let's take a typical city budget. One could argue that if you will, 95% should represent continuity, right? Because there's that long-range agenda you're working towards. There's the stuff you need to do to get there over multiple generations. But of course, every mayor <clears throat> wants to have a narrative, wants to have a signature, wants to have something they can own that they can claim. And I think that that's absolutely fine. And I think it is very important for political leaders <clears throat> to be storytellers to be able to weave narratives for their cities about what, where the city is today, what's its place in the world, what's its trajectory, where it wants to be, where it wants to go. The current narrative in Joburg are corridors of freedom. You know, one can argue whether that's the most compelling narrative, but you know, it's, it's a narrative, right? And, and in a way, it's a very interesting one because it is trying to do this kind of stuff. 
Of course, when we look at the bulk of the budget of what happens within cities, there's a whole bunch of things also that is required to begin to transform the routine operations that sits in the guts of, of, of our city governments. But the point that I want to make here is that it is not, we don't have to be stuck in this politics where we say, you know, there's no continuity, one politician wants to do their own thing, uh, the, you know, we shouldn't just be doing basic services, we must, you know, that kind of whole very tired, uh, uh, um, if you will, very unimaginative set of discourses that tend to dominate the, the public realm about our politics and, and what happens with city government. I think we can construct different narratives if we think more strategically about how we calibrate different investments, different resources. And for me, this kind of articulation fundamentally depends on the existence and the efficacy of intermediate organizations and networks that are able to forge what I would argue is a very special kind of urban politics and leadership. And, and we really, we have a paucity of these intermediary institutions, right? The people who can do the fine knitting, who can articulate these different impulses and dynamics of the city. And this is an horizon um, that, that, that I can talk more in, 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 in closing, but I've spoken way too long, so I'm gonna skip the last slide and just kind of mention the idea that, you know, that I think that the, prop the disposition of these characters is, is what I call being strategic, being radical, being inclusive, and being institutionally savvy. And I do think that this is possible, and I'm absolutely convinced that unless we are able to recognize that category of practitioner, urban regeneration that could potentially not save the city, but could at least begin to salvage some parts of the city for the common good uh, is unlikely to come to pass. So in summary then, what I've been trying to argue in a rather wide-ranging and maybe very abstracted way is that given the wealth of the resources we are throwing at the urban problematic, we should be doing a hell of a lot better in bringing more transformative urban regeneration to life. But, alas, as yet, we remain too fixated on a paternalistic politics of delivery and too afraid of a politics of deep, autonomous empowerment of the agents that urban regeneration is ostensibly for. Thank you.